invited me. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give this lecture series. Uh, so uh, this is uh, first of a uh, uh, three part lecture series. Today I will mainly talk about causality in quantum field theories in general quantum field theories. And this lecture is, uh, so today's topic is So, uh, these three lectures are mostly based on uh, three papers. So, these two with uh, Tom Hartman. and Sachin Jain and the last paper with Hartman and a PhD student Amir Tajdini. Uh, Quantum field theories are integral part of our lives and they have certain uh, properties. For example, if I, if somebody gives me a Lorentzian quantum field theory, it should have a few properties. First of all, obviously, it has to be Lorentz invariant. Secondly, it should be unitary and also it should be causal. Similarly, if somebody gives me a quantum field theory in Euclidean signature, first it has to be Euclidean invariant. It should be reflection. positive and also crossing symmetric. So, in the next lecture, I will explain this uh, properties in more detail. So, from the uh, title of the lecture series, you probably can guess that I will mainly focus on causality. So, it is an open question how causality is related to all these properties of uh, an Euclidean quantum field theory. In some sense, this question uh, was uh, addressed in 50s, 60s and 70s by Schwinger, uh, Weidman and Osterwelder, Schroeder. So, the, state, uh, the precise statement is the following. If you have a good uh, Euclidean quantum field theory and if, if you perform analytic continuation, that gives you a good Lorentzian quantum field theory which has all these properties. But uh, the point that I, I want to address is the following. So, what goes wrong if I, uh, if I have a quantum field theory in the Lorentzian signature which violate causality, 
what actually goes wrong in the Euclidean signature. Uh, before I proceed, let me uh, make a couple of comments on causality. Causality is the Lorentzian concept for obvious reason. Uh, if you want to talk about causality, you need to uh, have light cones. The main point that I want to focus on these lectures is the following. Causality can uh, impose non-trivial constraints on quantum field theories in Lorentzian signature. There are quantum field, there are Lorentz invariant quantum field theories which actually violate causality and I'll give you one example. And the next point is in quantum field theories causality is a statement uh, is an operator statement. So it a theory may appear to be causal in the vacuum but it can violate causality in non-trivial states. Because causality is a statement about uh, operators so a theory should be causal in any state and requiring a theory to be causal in any state actually uh, impose non-trivial constraints. Uh, here are a couple of examples. Uh, please feel free to uh, ask questions if you have any. Uh. Yeah, I have a question. <laughs> of course, the list of the three axioms there is uh, uh, gauge theories are those three axioms are incompatible. <laughs> Lorentz invariance, unitarity, and causality cannot hold at the same time in gauge theories. You are excluding gauge theories for your presentation? Uh, not really. Uh, 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 what kind of theories uh, are you uh, talking about? Whatever. Quantum electrodynamics. QED. Quantum electrodynamics. It doesn't work in QED. This QED list is of not UV complete, so let's start with the UV complete. Yeah, yeah. QCD is not satisfying the sections? No. I mean, I'm they are incompatible in gauge no. theories. I'm surprised to say so. It yeah. probably depends on which observables you look at. No. It's a theorem by Whiteman. No, okay. Okay. Let me start with uh, a scalar field theory with shift symmetry. So let's start with this action. So in a paper by uh, Adams, Arkani Hamed, uh, Duboski, Nicolis and Ratazzi in 2006, they argued that this coefficient mu has to be positive, uh, uh, otherwise this theory cannot be UV completed. So obviously this is, uh, this uh, uh, coefficient is uh, non renormalizable so this is an effective field theory and their argument is basically if mu is negative uh, this theory is sick and there is no UV completion. Uh, and this uh, constraint actually played an important role in the proof of C theorem in 4D. And let me give you a classical uh, proof of this bound. So, phi equals to classically phi equals to zero is a solution of this theory, but let's consider a, a somewhat non-trivial solution of this uh, theory. So, let's consider this solution, where this is a constant vector. Oh, so that's a solution of this. Uh, Write, uh, I, I write down the equation of motion, this is a solution, you can just check. So what uh, I want to consider is basically propagation of this perturbation 
in this background. So ag again, I can write down equations of motion for del phi. So it goes like this. Uh, in the plane of basis, this is simply okay. Now, for simplicity, let's take C uh, to be a time like vector. So, my C is C naught and 0 and k is omega and vector k. If I plug that in here, that gives me So, if mu is negative, this is uh, the speed of propagation is uh, greater than 1. So, that is one reason why mu has to be non negative. So, in this original paper by uh, Adams et al., they had another beautiful argument why mu has to be positive from by considering 2 to 2 scattering of phi and they basically showed that unitarity tells you that this has to be positive. Uh, an important point about all, both of these uh, proofs uh, is that they make sense uh, only in Lorentzian signature. So, one might ask, uh, what goes wrong in the Euclidean theory if mu is negative? Yes. So you said this this should be proved that there is a UV completion. But should you should you should you still prove that uh, no term you can you can you cannot add any term to this Lagrangian higher order terms that would fix it? So, have so this classical argument is not sufficient obviously sufficient for that. Yeah, this is a very rough argument. Like there, there is a actual proof of this statement. Okay. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I know they are the argument which is based on unitarity, and I think it's a solid argument. But this argument, which is also given by the paper, it leaves some unsatisfactory feeling because you say, okay, this background, I can see this background where phi zero grows at infinity. Yeah. Is this actually a valid background? Should I, if something weird happens in this background, maybe I should not be particularly concerned? They tried to answer this question in the paper by like taking a bubble inside. Uh, so this is this solution is valid in some bubble, yeah. and then it goes to zero outside that bubble. Uh, it, they they, they tried to make that argument in the in the paper that like yeah you, you can make probably make this precise, okay. but pro because they had another argument, I guess they didn't. Actually, uh, it makes you move space like vector. <coughs> yeah, you can do that. Yeah, then it change sometimes. You'll it, get the same result, yes. Okay, so another example comes from uh, gravity. So now, consider gravity in, let's say, 5D. Where I have the Einstein gravity, uh, Einstein-Hilbert term. I have some 
negative cosmological constant though I do not need this term it is I just let me just keep it here and I also have some higher derivative correction terms. So, this is uh, the Gauss Bonnet uh, term in uh, 5D. So, this is a Gauss free combination of uh, all possible R square terms and M2 is some mass scale which is uh, far below the Planck scale and C2 is some order 1 number. So, just as a uh, Lagrangian you can just check that uh, you can uh, this is perturbatively consistent up to some scale m which is parametrically higher than m 2. Uh, in a paper uh, in 2014 by Edelstein, Kamano, Edelstein, Maldasena and Zibayadav. Can you explain why yeah. it is not why is the cutoff not m2? Yes, so it is just uh, you just take uh, because there is an overall m2. Yeah, so it is basically something like square root of m2 times m Planck, something like that. Okay, okay so uh, in the paper by Kamanho, Edelstein, Maldasena, and Zavedov, which I will refer to as KEMS from 2014, they uh, studied shockwave solutions in this background in ADS. So, you have something like this where u and v they are null coordinates and z is the uh, bulk coordinate. They basically studied shockwave solutions in this background. So, you have some function of z and y a delta function. So, this is a shockwave. So, uh, let me draw a diagram. So, this is v, this is u. So, this shockwave is propagating this way. Now, uh, let me take a graviton, probe graviton and send it in this background. So, uh, when that graviton hits the uh, shock, there is a jump and let me call that jump delta v. So, uh, bulk causality uh, requires that this delta v has to be positive. If delta v is negative that, that, that means there is some time advance. So, in this particular paper uh, they send uh, gravitons with various polarizations and they showed that delta v is uh, always positive if and only if c2 is 0. So, that means uh, pure gauss bonnet theory is a causal. So, now from the uh, point of view uh, point of view of effective field theory uh, this this has the following meaning. So, as I said earlier, so I have scale m2, m Planck. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, this is perturbatively consistent up to some scale m, which is parametrically higher. So, naively, I would expect that new physics should appear here. to make uh, everything well behaved. But this argument tells you that actually new physics should appear here 
and fix this causality violation. So the okay. growth factor is the So it's basically if you uh, like if you just take this theory if you if I just give you this theory and if you just study perturbation theory, then you'll see that there is actually it breaks down at this scale. But then we yeah. call the strong coupling scale, which is not necessarily the capacity. Yes, so basically M2 is basically like you, it, if I have a theory and I uh, integrates out everything above M2, you should get some, some, something like the, this. But just as a Lagrangian, it's, it doesn't require that. But at the classical level, this theory with the square and the curvature, there is no a priori, maybe it's the case, but there's no a priori reason that the characteristic cone is still the null cone. Uh, say that again. For Einstein theory, mm -hmm. we know that the characteristic cone for the propagation is the null cone. Mm -hmm. But for such a theory with the R square, mm -hmm. there is no reason a priori, because in some sense in front of, you could have G mu nu plus extra term in front of the main part of the field equation. Yeah, yeah. So if it's uh, classically, it's not causal. That, that's right. Like you can make that argument classically, but there are again there is, there is another argument which shows the same thing. So this is a very classical rough picture, but there are other arguments which shows that. But there is no. What I say is that there is no reason to, to require the, the usual causality uh, for such theory. Yeah, but like if you study, let's say, uh, graviton scattering in. Uh, uh, in ADS with for this theory, that should have unitarity things like that. Unitarity is similar. Yeah, so there's a quantum one. Yeah. And, and talking at the classical. Yeah, classical level. Yeah. So this this is classical argument, but there there are uh, uh, analogous quantum argument which gives you the same uh, result. Yes. Classical. Yeah. This classical argument can have a, can have problem, but that quantum argument is there actually. So uh, the goal of today's uh, or these three lectures are the following. So understand. Causality in quantum field theory. This is what I covered today. Then, as I said earlier, uh, causality violation in Lorentz signature uh, uh, tells you that there has to be something wrong in the Euclidean signature. Uh, then, uh, I'll consider CFTs in D. Uh, greater than two dimensions to show that uh, reflection positivity plus crossing uh, guarantee that uh, the Lorentzian theory is causal. Then uh, I'll use that to derive constraints uh, on uh, interactions of low dimensional operators regardless of what happens in the UV. And fourth, uh, I'll show that these constraints are uh, intimately related to 
the averaged null energy condition. So, I will provide a proof of the averaged null energy condition from causality. So, this is today. So, this is lecture 2 and this is lecture 3. So, in uh, quantum field theory, causality is a statement about commutators. So, this commutator uh, should be 0 if they are space like separated. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is an operator statement. So, if I plug this uh, commutator inside any correlator, that correlator should be should also be 0. So, because of that, uh, a theory may look uh, may appear to be causal in the vacuum, but in some non trivial state, this can this uh, condition can actually be uh, uh, non trivial. Okay. So, we, in a quantum field theory, whenever we compute some correlation function, Generally, what we do is we start with the Euclidean theory, we compute the correlators, and then we perform analytic continuation to get Lorentzian correlators. So, Euclidean correlators has certain properties. First of all, they are uh, single valued. So, let us say if I take a endpoint function, so this function this is a single valued function, second is its uh, permutation invariant. That means, if I change orders uh, of, of the operators in the Euclidean correlator that uh, does not change the function. Can you repeat sir, I'm asking this discussion. Mm, so, sorry? You exclude fermions for simplicity. Yes, yeah, 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 Th yeah, <coughs> that is right. <coughs> and third is uh, this function is analytic and it analytic and it does not have uh, branch cuts as long as all the points uh, remain Euclidean. The fact that uh, it is permutation invariant that means basically in Euclidean signature uh, commutators uh, do vanish. Uh, then I perform the standard analytic continuation to get Lorentzian correlators. So, uh, uh, for that uh, I take uh, one Euclidean direc direction arbitrarily and I will call that tau and I will analytically, analytically continue that to I t where now t is real. So, that uh, leads to uh, 
one question. When do a set of Euclidean correlators define a causal theory. So, this question was answered uh, uh, by Osterwelder and Schroeder and which goes by the name the reconstruction theorem. And seventy-five. Uh, reconstruction theorem tells us that well-behaved Euclidean uh, correlators uh, after analytic con continuation leads to well-behaved Lorentzian correlators. So let me write down. Uh, E C for Euclidean correlators. So, by uh, well behaved Euclidean correlator, I mean uh, they are analytic uh, from uh, coincident points, they are uh, SOD invariant, uh, crossing symmetric reflection positive and uh, obey certain growth condition which is not uh, relevant for our discussion. And by well behaved Lorentzian correlator I mean they are Lorentz uh, invariant, causal and unitary. So, the point of view that I want to take is somewhat different. I will only assume a limited, I will only assume some limited information about the quantum field theory. So, I will assume something about the, uh, I will assume something about few low dimensional operators and I want to know if uh, that set of information is compatible with causality or not. So, in uh, uh, reconstruction theorem does not actually give an answer to that question, it just it tells you that uh, well behaved Euclidean correlator will give you causality violation, but it does not tell you exactly what like if, if, if I have a causality violating theory, it does not tell you what goes wrong exactly. So, that uh, leads to analytic continuation. Uh, so, this uh, equilibrium correlator G I said earlier that it is an analytic function of uh, positions. Uh, so, uh, if my tau is uh, real then this is an analytic function. Yes. So, uh, but as a function of complex tau, so this function g uh, can have uh, intricate structure of singularities and branch cards. Do you think do you are talking about only one time or all the times? Uh, are you ordering the times in any way? So, in the in the uh, Lorentzian signature, yes, that's that's what my goal is. In Euclidean. So in Euclidean signature, so this is I'm just starting with the Euclidean, Euclidean correlator, which doesn't care about the ordering. So all the points are Euclidean. But when you go to continuity. Yeah. So the, then in the Lorentzian correlator, I'll I'll care about the ordering, and I, yeah, I, I, I'm going to talk about that. Yes. Okay. You can 
n tau, so you have tau 1, tau Yes, yes, so yeah. Yes, and OK. So for simplicity, I'll just, uh, I'll uh, just analytically continue one of them, not, not all. So because of this, uh, because this uh, function has branch curves, so this analytic continuation is actually ambiguous. Uh, that uh, sounds problematic, but actually that's not a bad thing. You can actually show that each choice that you make uh, uh, in, in this analytic continuation translates into a particular ordering in the resulting Lorentzian correlator. So basically, that means because of this branch curves, uh, operator ordering does matter in the Euclidean signature. So these branch curves are actually responsible for a non-vanishing commutators in the Lorentzian signature. Uh, let me give you uh, one simple example. Uh, let's consider this two point function. So in the Euclidean signature, I can just compute this two point function. Just for simplicity, let me call them O1 and O2. So first I compute the Euclidean correlator, let me call this G. So complex tau, in the complex tau plane, so there is a branch cut at, let me just take away x, at i x and minus i x. So if I want to compute the Lorentzian correlator, I'll start from the Euclidean one and I'll analytically continue. If in the Lorentzian signature O1 and O2 they are uh, space like separated, then basically I have to analytically continue from here to let's say somewhere here and there is no ambiguity. However, uh, if in the Lorentzian signature O1 and O2 they are time like separated, then I have to start from here and radically continue somewhere here. And because of the branch cut, <coughs> so because of the branch cut, you can do it in two different ways. So one will give you the time ordered one and the other one will give you the anti time ordered two point function. So what are the rules? So first of all, uh, the one important thing is whenever you hit this uh, singularity only after that. Uh, you have these two choices. So that means this singularity is responsible for uh, non-vanishing commutators. Uh, not that is responsible responsible for non-vanishing commutator between O1 and O2. So the what are the rules for this analytic continuation? So if I have a singularity, I can either uh, pass this singularity from the left or from the right. If I pass this singularity from the right, that gives me time ordered correlator. If I cross this singularity from the left, that gives me anti time ordered. So this one. Uh, gives me O1 T X 
and this one gives me so this discontinuity across the uh, branch cut that basically gives you the uh, commutator of O1 and O2. Now let me give you uh, one more involved uh, example. Let us now consider four point functions. Mm -hmm. Ray from dimensions will be integer, that commutator will still vanish. Yes. And um, if instead it's interacting, it will not. Uh, probably it yeah, it does tell you something about the CFT, but for us at least for us only thing that matters is if it's non zero or not. Or it can be non zero or not. So that that's the only thing that, that we care about because that uh, that's the signature of causality violation. Okay, let's okay. Let's now consider this four-point function. This is t. This is y. So t is the this t is the Lorentzian time, and this is some uh, arbitrary direction. So my o one is here, my o three and o four they are here. Let me draw the, the light cones. Okay, and my O2 is uh, let's say somewhere here. So all of the O1, O3, and O4 they are space like separated and they are at t equals to 0. Only O2 has uh, some non zero uh, time component. So as now this correlator uh, in the complex tau two plane has this uh, structure of singularities and branch cuts. So first singularity appears when this O two hits this light cone of O one. So that's I times R. Uh, O2 minus O1. And the next singularity appears when this O2 hits the light cone of O3. And yeah, there are branch cards. And there, are, there is one more singularity because of this O4, but let me ignore that. And similarly, there should be singularities on the lower half plane. So now uh, consider this case. When O2 is uh, time like separated with respect to O1 and O3, so let, it's somewhere here. So because this is inside the light cone of O1 and O3. So in this language, so I should start from somewhere here and I have to radically continue to this point here. So when it is basically above both of these singularities, let me just somewhere here let us say. So there are obviously uh, you can imme immediately check that there are four different analytic continuation that you can perform. First one is this one. Let me call that A. So this goes, uh, this uh, passes this singularity from the right, also this singularity from the right. So this is 
when this operator O2 is time ordered with respect to both O1 and O3. So that's O2, O1, O3, O4. The second thing that you can do is this. So you can radically continue this way. Right of this, then left of the other uh, singularity. So as I said, according to our uh, uh, rules, O2 should be time ordered with respect to uh, the operator responsible for the singularity that is uh, O1, but it should be time uh, anti time ordered with respect to O3. So, this is O3, O2, O1, O4. The next thing you can do is this one left of this singularity then write of this. So, this is B, this is C. So, you are crossing this singularity from the left. That means, O1 and O2 they are anti time ordered. So, O1, O2, O3, O4. So, O2 is uh, anti time ordered with respect to O1, but time ordered with respect to O3. And the fourth one is this one. Where the correlator is uh, completely anti time ordered. So, there are four uh, choices for analytic continuations, and in the Lorentzian signature, you can write down these four uh, uh, different Lorentzian correlators. Okay. Now, uh, let me uh, make the statement about causality. Okay, I will need this board. So, let us now consider a special case of the last example. Okay, so, again I have four operators. So, this is time, this is y. So, I have a, an operator psi, an operator O, another psi. So, this is the light cone. And I have another operator O, which is uh, time like separated with respect to psi. So, it is somewhere here and it is approaching the light cone of other O. So, I have another operator O. So, uh, in the language of analytic continuation, so this is what I am doing. So, I again I have to branch cuts. So, basically I am approaching this singularity. So, I am approaching this singularity and again I can do it in two different ways. I can choose to go from left or from right. Now, first consider the simpler one. So, this is the correlator uh, O, O, psi, psi. So, uh, when I hit uh, this singularity along this path, you better yes. give different names to your two O's because now it is not clear. Uh, that actually does, does not matter uh, yeah i can do, i can do that that's so 
Uh, I care about the committed, so I, it, it will give you a different sign. That's it. it right. It's approaching it from below, so there's still. Uh, yeah, from the below, yes. So it's basically like I, I basically want to uh, study this singularity by approaching it from the below. So when uh, you hit this singularity, at, at that point, the O, o commutator becomes non zero. So this thing. becomes non-zero when I hit this singularity. Now, if I uh, follow this path, as I said earlier, this singularity is fixed by light cone. So as long as I'm below this uh, singularity, this is zero. And that means this is, this correlator is causal. And that's not very surprising. This is, so th this correlator is kind of uh, fixed by the light cone structure. Now let's look at this correlator. This is psi o o psi. So this quantity psi commutator of o and o with psi, this becomes non-zero when I hit this singularity, but along this path. But f f because I'm crossing this branch cut the position of the singularity is no longer fixed. So on, basically, I'm going to the second sheet of this uh, li, uh, Euclidean correlator. And on the second sheet, this singularity can actually move around. S and this commutator becomes, or this correlator, correlator becomes non-zero when I uh, hit this singularity, but on the second sheet. Okay, so now the statement of causality. Okay, now let me erase the trivial one. Okay, let me now look at uh, this uh, analytic continuation. So two things. Uh, when I do this at a continuation, two things uh, can happen. So on the second sheet, this singularity can, uh, let's say, move in the upward direction somewhere here. So if that happens, then this correlator becomes uh, non-zero when I hit this point. Now, in this diagram, that point is somewhere here. So that means this correlator becomes non-zero at a later time than you expect from the light cone. That means there is some kind of time delay. And that's all right. There is nothing wrong about uh, having a time delay. However, if this singularity, so this, this is what gives you. However, if this singularity moves in the downward direction, that means this correlator with the commutators becomes non-zero, uh, let's say somewhere here. But, but that means, uh, so this operator O and this operator O, they are now space-like separated. But even then, this is uh, non-zero. That means uh, this is a causal. Or you can say that there is some uh, time advance. So uh, that, uh, so the statement of causality is basically this singularity on the second sheet cannot move in the downward direction. So this is not allowed. Okay, so let me summarize. The first statement is but, but 
Ah, so, uh, I don't know of any example where it moves at all. So the state, like the causality tells you it cannot move in the downward direction, but in principle, it's, it's allowed to move in the upward direction. But I don't know, know of any example where uh, it moves. In fact, uh, in CFT2, you can actually show that this singularity can, it doesn't move at all. So starting from the Euclidean correlator, uh, causality uh, on the first sheet is trivial. The non-trivial statement about causality is a constraint on how singularities move around in the complex tau plane uh, when uh, we pass other light cone branch curves. So uh, in the next lecture, uh, I'll use this setup to derive constraints on uh, interactions of low dimensional dimensional operators in uh, conformal field theories in dimension greater than two. And uh, next week I'll comment on how these constraints uh, are related to the average energy condition. So let me stop here. Can, can you remind us what determined, like th there was some tacit assumption that the first sheet corresponded to both branch cuts going like you drew them on mm -hmm. the left. Mm -hmm. Why the left and not on the right. Okay, so this is kind of a cartoon. Where did this get broken, the symmetry? So it, it, it's not a, like, it's not a, like, you can actually forget about these branch cuts altogether. Okay. So what you can do, uh, let me draw, draw it again. So let's just consider the two-point function. Then that's easier. So if I have a single, if I have this singularity, and if I if I just do two things, I compute this function and I just compute this function, and I can just match these two functions. I can check if they are the same or not. Yeah. So you, you can just check that they, they are because of this uh, singularity that they are not the same uh, function. So we draw a branch cut somewhere here. So you can just so in the, I'm drawing this branch cuts. I, you can actually just forget about this branch cut. You can just follow this path and find out that function here. So all I'm doing, I'm just saying I'm approaching uh, this uh, imaginary axis from the left or from the right. So that that's the only thing I'm doing. But why? What? Why was? Where was the symmetry between left and right broken? So uh, it's not as. Uh, no, but you, so you said that when you approach from the right, mm -hmm. from the right it's trivial, and from the left non-trivial. Uh, yeah. So, so okay. So why is this symmetry broken? So it's not like okay. <laughs> probably there is a symmetry between which I call trivial and which one I call non-trivial. Yeah. So there has to be some formulation of this, not in terms of left, uh, right, and left, but in terms of some other. So okay, what you can do, you can somebody can just choose to draw them on the on the right side. Then basically you can just do the whole things so of in in my rules of anti continuation. I can just move the left to right and the right to left. It's basically it's just identical. So the w the reason I'm drawing the in this particular way so that the trivial anti continuation that gives you the time ordering. 
by trivial, I mean like just I, I'll take a point from here and I'll just analytically continue this way. Start from positive tau and then you rotate. Yeah, so that, that gives me the uh, time ordered uh, correlator. But I don't have, like, I, I can just choose the branch curves in, in this direction and then I, I, I'll just call this one time ordering. That's it. You made a comment before uh, concerning that you are going beyond uh, the Osterlander Schaller uh, mm -hmm. con continuation uh, reconstruction. What is the point here with ah. respect to? I mean, you are exploring other regions with respect to what they did in. Uh, so, it, it, for the, the reconstruction theorem, basically, you need to know all the correlators and everything. So here, I'm just I have a single correlator, and I can talk about causality of that, like if that correlator is, will give you a causal Lorentzian correlator or not. So it's basically, I'm, I only have this, if I start with this limited information, even then I can talk about causality. That's, that's my point. So be, or in other words, basically, uh, I don't care if this comes from some uh, uh, quantum field theory, which uh, has all the good properties. Only thing I, I can, uh, the thing I want to show, if I have some correlator, uh, and it has this, uh, and it has this analytic properties. If it's consistent with causality or not, I don't care if it it comes from some. What do you assume on the Euclidean side? So on the Euclidean side, basically, uh, I okay. So I assumed everything on the Euclidean side, but only for this correlator. I don't care about all the rest rest of the correlators that you can have on that particular theory. So it's basically in that sense, it's it's some limited information. Can't you say that? <laughs> can't you say that you will, unlike Osterwalder Schrader, who reached some qualitative conclusions about what is good and what is bad, you will reach some quantitative conclusions. Like you will be able to derive some constraints on the data of your theory. Yes. Some numer numerical answers about what can happen and what cannot happen, and this was not contained in those theorems. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So. Next week, I'll move on to CFT, where when I can actually use this uh, uh, setup, where I, this setup will actually give you non-trivial uh, constraints. So what that tells you, like though, it doesn't matter what kind of theory, what kind of CFTs you are looking at, all of them should obey those constraints. Okay. You mentioned that you will, you will use also reflection positive. Up to this point, I haven't seen. Okay, so up to, so this is now so far this is a statement about the lower, like what does it mean to be a causal Lorentzian correlator? So next week basically what I'll, I'll show that if I start uh, from a Euclidean theory and it, let's say if I start from this correlator in the Euclidean signature, if it obeys uh, reflection positivity and uh, crossing symmetry, then this is guaranteed that this will not move in the downward direction. That's that's guaranteed. Yes. Uh, I have a question about your the rules you assign. Uh, is is it just a, a, a there any deep, deeper reason for for how how you how you read the uh, ordering from the way you analytical continuity? So, so there is uh, uh, basically reconstruction theorem does one more thing. It actually tells you uh, how you can uh, analytically continue one Euclidean correlator to get different Lorentzian correlators. So the, the, the rules that I uh, described today, they are basically equivalent to those, uh, the, the one that you get from reconstruction theorem. So in rec reconstruction theorem, what you do, you, you use some I epsilon prescription, which basically shifts this singularity either on, the, uh, on this side or this side. So you can do this analytic continuation in two different ways. Either you can, you can choose to move the singularities or you can choose to move the uh, path which you take to do the analytic continuation. And both are equivalent. So all I have to check is basically, I, I am not, uh, uh, all I have to check is basically, this prescription is in agreement with the known I epsilon prescription. And uh, yeah, it agrees with I epsilon prescription. Yes. Since, since there was a question, can you clarify which I think is possible to clarify. Uh, so to 
in which sense, to which correlation functions, to which observables uh, would your discussion apply if we had a gauge theory, something like Young Mills and Forty, some UV complete gauge theory? Uh, whatever I said should be like, if you manage to give me a, a four point function in the position space, everything I said that should go through. Well, which on which operators? Any scalar up, any uh, bosonic operator will do. It, 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 it shouldn't matter. It will not be reflection positive, by the way. Sh it should no, be a gauge invariant operator, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. It should be a gauge invariant operator. Yes, it, it, it has to be a gauge invariant, that, that's right, yes. And pro probably it's, uh, we can still allow fermi fermionic operators, but you have to be more careful. Like, it, uh, this is for scalar, so I, I'm sure there is an easy generalization of this for fermions. But, but fermionic or otherwise, I think that's easy to, to fix. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> The more important is if it is gauge variant or not. Yeah. And I believe that this will apply really to gauge model. Otherwise you will otherwise you will never have the never have the fact. Yeah. Yeah, but just some yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, isn't it because uh, kind of long time ago this discussion of what is the domain of analyticity for green functions? Yeah, because we have configuration space and thin space and some mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's it's kind of unknown for many points, and is it, it's about geometry of this, uh, all, all of this discussions about uh, analytic uh, kind of convexity envelope for this domain. Uh, is it anything else uh, here? This is kind of complex so analysis the, question that you get. So because uh, th the cases that I consider today, they are kind of simple because I'm analytically continuing only one point. So, but there are known subtleties if you have, if you just try to analytically continue all four points, let's say, there are like known subtleties. Like, uh, they are, it's possible that this one to one correspondence between number of analytic continuation and number of uh, uh, orderings in the Lorentzian signature, that one to one correspondence might not be true uh, if I analytically continue all of them. So, there are subtleties, yes. Uh, no, but mathematical questions, you have some domain and that function you want to see where you have other values of point. Yes. So uh, I'll actually comment on that on, on the third lecture. That 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 will actually be important for uh, the discussion. Because you are assuming that you have only cuts here. Yes. Only, yeah. This is yeah. A not known. Yeah, in yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, but you see, this is a minimal set of four. So you see, it's the other way around, the way I understand it. If you find that this particular commutator is not causal, the theory is not causal, it does not tell you that every other commutator will also be causal. Like what you ask is a much more general question, is whether the entire theory. But what you want to see is <laughs> if you have a constraint that tells you that this one commutator is not causal or not. If one computation is non causal, then the theory is non causal. But even for this particular thing, it's assuming something concerning the analytic yeah. structure yes. of the yes. four point functions, yes. so which is not known. Well, yeah, but you can do it for the two okay. point functions. Okay. Yeah, okay. Do it for the two point functions. Two point, okay. <laughs> But, but there is an old theorem due to a uh, Bergman called Whiteman, which tells you a domain where the, the Euclidean correlator is a uh, single valued analytic function. Mm -hmm. So, can you see this domain in your consideration somehow? Uh, not in this. To, to, to find the, uh, uh, the, uh, the domain of homomorphism, <coughs> which is the angle of this. But mm -hmm. So, not in this con construction, but. Uh, so when I'll prove uh, average, uh, average non-energy condition, there it will be important. So I'll, I'll discuss that. So this is a very, uh, this is a minimal setup. So this, this, like, this is, I guess, uh, too restrictive. So uh, we might not be able to see everything from this setup, yes. Yeah. Can you also assume locality in a certain set? You're, you're talking about local operators. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they are local operators. Yes, that, that's right. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. Yes. So, so you consider quantum field theories, okay? For example, define Euclidean, where you can define gauge invariant operators. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, because I'm not studying from uh, a Lagrangian, it's basically all I'm, uh, all I have is basically some gauge invariant local operators uh, in the theory. That's it. Uh, because I guess there exists quantum field theories where we don't have gauge invariant local operators. 
Worry. Then you have to worry. <laughs> I was wondering how much of this would go through. Like how, how uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I haven't thought about that, so I, I'll probably I have to. Yeah, I have to think about that. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, no? we're now just preparing to clap. So let's thank speaker again. <laughs>